It's round two of the Tata Steel Masters, and I'm looking at the game between Ali Reza Firuz Ja and Parham Mahsud Lu. Of course, these two know each other very well. They played several times against each other when they were growing up in Iran. Of course, now Firuz Ja represents France, but Mahsud Lu still represents Iran. Um, in their early days, Mahsud Lu always had the better score. Now, he is a bit older. He's 23 years old now, and Firuz Ja is 20. So maybe when they were much younger, the age difference counted. But more recently, certainly, they've had some online games where uh, Firuz Ja has come out on top. We've got a Berlin. Oh, yes. A riveting opening. I know you all love it. Now, D4 brings about this famous endgame, like this, for example, which has proved to be a very tough nut to crack. But Furious Jar goes for Rook E1, and Knight takes. I think this line really is very hard for Black to generate winning chances. But white always has a little something. So obviously there are uh, threats on the e-file, so bishop e7, and the bishop drops all the way back to f1, just clears out of the way. Knight takes, rook takes, and castles. So we've got one open file, pawns are symmetrical, if black could somehow arrange for that knight to move and play d5, black wouldn't have any difficulties at all. But it's that knight which just makes things a little bit problematic. d4. So, I mean, I think it's obvious that it's easier for white to play than black. You know, white's development is just pretty straightforward, whereas with the knight here, it's not so simple. Of course, it's possible to play knight f5 here, attacking this pawn. And then after c3, well, d5 is very respectable for black. Uh, but usually d5, if white wants something, then d5, claiming some space, is the move. But rook e8, very respectable move. And the point is that the knight is going to be able to drop back to e8 and then d5. But bishop f4 is an interesting move, and this traditionally has been the way to try to upset black. Exchange of rooks, of course. Black does not object to exchanging pieces when you're under a little bit of pressure. So this involves a pawn sacrifice. Carlson Gukesh, an online game, went bishop takes... And Carlson had compensation, there's no doubt about it. You can see that white's pieces can enter the game very easily. Black is way behind in development, and obviously this double pawn doesn't count for much anyway. So instead of taking the pawn, Maksud Lu played knight e8. Just preparing to advance that pawn to one of these squares. Knight c3. So Firuz Ja persisted with uh, offering a pawn. And this is the one that... I mean, this move is important because if white puts the brakes on, let's say with c3, it's going to be possible to play d5. And black is getting pretty close to equalising with you know, bishop b6 and, and knight out. So knight c3 is really the only way to try to get something from this position. And the point being that if d5, that can be taken because the knight here hangs. And this is a well-known pawn sacrifice. Bishop takes pawn and knight d5. I mean, you know, if you look in your database, you'll find, I don't know, 70, 80 games played with this. 
So it's it's fairly well known. And it's, it starts to get a bit tricky because this bishop is loose. You know, there's some pressure here. Black's king side doesn't have too many defenders, and white's pieces can come into the game very easily. d6. Okay, shuts out the bishop, and now bishop g5. Of course, that can't be taken because of the back rank checkmate. And f6 was played, which is the best move. Uh, and black has to be very careful here. So, for example, if queen d7, then this just gives white a beautiful rolling initiative. And this is already very, very uncomfortable for black. Um, let's go back. So f6 played. And the bishop has to move. And well, we've had games with bishop e3, but bishop h4 has also been played in around 30 games. So, you know, it's not like um, the players are in unknown territory. I mean, Firuz Jar was moving pretty quickly. Uh, Magsudlu, the same. But here is where Magsud Lu thought for about 20 minutes. So he obviously got a bit spooked. He knows it's a well-known line. So he, he must be thinking, okay, why is Firuz Jar going in for this? The machines think it's roughly level. You know, white, maybe a little bit of an advantage, but not much. In practice, actually, white has done very well from this position, in spite of what the machines say. Uh, funnily enough, Firuz Jar had this exact position with black in St. Louis uh, last summer. And he played g5, which was very complicated, but uh, he managed to make a draw against Vachier Le Grave. But bishop takes b2 played instead. And rook b1. And the bishop came back to e5. So black is now two pawns up. But after f4, it's, um, it's a little bit tricky. So the, uh, the standard move here, <laughs> and it's incredible to, to say after 18 moves, the standard move, because, you know, they've been... Uh, you know, a couple of dozen games um, have been played from this position. And c6 is the move. So obviously black would like it if this knight fell back, so white careers on. I should say this didn't happen. And bishop d3. So as I said, the computers think this position is roughly level, but in practice... White has scored very well, even though white is two pawns down, but these bishops are pretty nice, and white's queen and rook are very active, and black has yet to develop successfully. So it's an interesting choice from Firuz Jar. He must have looked at this position very deeply and found some little wrinkle that would put pressure on his opponent. In any case, after f4, Max Sudlu did not play c6. Instead, he played bishop e6. So according to my database, this is a new move. But it's not a very good one. And you have to play this precisely with white, but here is where Firuz Jar takes control. Bishop c4. This is the best move. That's the only move to give white an advantage. This bishop is attacked. Bishop d4 check. King in the corner. The bishop is attacked, and if bishop takes, watch this. That would be very embarrassing. Look at the knight. It has no square to move to. And then there's no defence to queen g8 mate. How funny. So this is basically the problem with black's position. It's so difficult to coordinate 
to get some kind of stable position when this knight simply has no moves. Bishop dropped back to f7. And another excellent move from Fru's Jar. He is very powerful with the initiative. It is one of his great strengths that he's a good attacker. So brings the queen up, gains time by attacking the queen. A check. So if the king steps in the corner, then bishop takes bishop. So king f8. And queen takes pawn. And this is already absolutely horrible for black. I mean, who knows? Perhaps Maksudlu uh, miscalculated, miscalculated roundabout here. Um, this knight can't be captured. That leads to checkmate. Or king takes. This is pretty awful. Look at that knight. It's dreadful. And apart from the fact that the king is in massive trouble, but that knight can't move. Maksudlu played bishop takes bishop in this position. And here is the problem that white can play rook e1, just protecting that knight. And now there's a clear threat. Here Maksudlu gave up the queen. He has to. Because if, let's say, queen here, check, and mate on g8. So giving up the queen was necessary. Now, if black can play with rook and two minor pieces against the queen, he's doing fine. That's the problem. The queen darts back, and it's a simple double attack. Bishop e6 played, but of course that wins the piece anyway. Well, Firuz Jar has a winning position, but does he have the technique to finish it off? Let's see. Rook d8. Although this knight can't move at the moment, you know, it might be able to get out if c6 and d5 come, and then knight d6. And, you know, if he can reach d4, uh, e4 rather, then black might be able to hold things together. But I, I really like the way Firuz Jar plays now. So, first of all, he doesn't capture yet. He can decide later which is the best piece. First of all, he realises he's got to include that bishop in the, in the attack. At the moment, it's just doing nothing. The queen needs some help. So, g4, great move. That solves the back rank problem. That's a nice positive about it. So white never has to worry about a back rank. But the pawn simply wants to advance to soften that f6 pawn. And then the bishop comes into play. So for example, if d5, okay, then we can take that. And the bishop comes back, should be winning for white. c6 played. Again, no need to take that bishop if, if you're not provoked. g5. Let's just stick to the program and get this bishop into the game. King back. Pawn takes. So in this way, white wins a tempo because there's a threat to play e7. So the king goes back. Yeah, incidentally, if d5, then queen g6 is winning. Um, so king e7, an exchange. You can see how this has brought the bishop into the game. You know, at the moment, the knight is defending that pawn, but the knight really doesn't want to have to stay on e8. And... Firuz Jar plays it accurately. You know, he could have done something like this. Probably good, but that would definitely prolong the game. But he finds a really nice manoeuvre. Queen g4. So one thing is it's keeping that knight locked onto this square. Because if knight d7, then queen g7 check wins. d5. 
played, and here's the point, queen g8. So all the while keeping an eye on that pawn, the queen has maneuvered around here, and it's ready to give a check on f7. So, yeah, let's just check this out. So what, what about knight d6? What happens if black tries to activate? Well, there's more than one way to win this, but this will do. And mate. So you see that knight really can't get out. Here's another one. Knight c7, check, and mate. And that's a massive problem for black. Bishop d4. Okay, still doesn't check here. And said bishop g3. So now queen f7 would be mate. So black has to interpose. Exchange. And h4. Again, there's no need to check the king yet. It's simply not necessary. So, for example, again, what happens if that knight moves? Knight here. Queen g5 check. Beautiful. So if the king goes back, then the rook is still shut out, and you can advance the pawn. And of course, if king takes pawn, then queen takes rook. So this is black's problem. Firu's just clever play means that that knight just can't get in the game. So the game finished like this. e4, h5, time to push that pawn. Check. E7. So if the rook moves up, knight will be taken. A check. Take one of those pawns. Watch out, that rook is undefended. So if king f7, I mean the king needs to come over to try to stop that pawn, but that's a problem. <laughs> the rook is loose. So king d7. Okay, let's swipe another pawn. And h6. The knight finally gets in the game, but it's too late. Um, yeah, rook e8, h7. Game over. Alternatively, king e7. Be nice to bring the knight back here. But check. The queen is just way too strong. Check. Skewer here, potentially problematic. H7. That pawn is going to go through one way or another. Yeah, the black's pieces are just too loose when playing against the queen and that pawn. I thought it was beautifully finished by Furu's jar. You know, he really played... The attack so well I mean really perfectly actually but coming back to this position I find it curious that Marsoud Lu played this move bishop e6 it looks like a mistake c6 has been played before it's tricky but black does appear to be okay but Marsoud Lu somehow got psyched out who knows be interesting to find out the the story, uh, you know, what, what lay behind Masudu's thinking. So after two rounds, we have a clear leader, Ali Reza Firuz Jar. More coming soon. Thanks for watching.